You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. This podcast is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, who have been telling Oklahoma's story through its people since 1927. Follow them online at oklahomahof.com, and then definitely follow them on Instagram for all the information that you need, because I'm sure that's where you follow us as well, at oklahomahof. Let's get into today's episode. Uh, First episode... Uh, I think, no, I'd say first, it's not. Second episode with a beer brewing company, person, brewer, thing, whatever you call them, <laughs> breweries, right? You're a brewer, yeah. which sounds really strange coming from a person with an accent, right? Yeah. You know, you say it like a craft brewery, sounds. Anyway, um, Mr. Jake Keys is on the podcast with me today. I have previously been on his podcast, which we will link in the description. So you can go listen to that if you want to hear my story. If not, you don't have to totally totally okay with that you probably heard enough about me um but no i'm excited to do this you know it's, it's fun to do podcasts with other podcasters because you know you get to sit in the chair and or you don't get to sit in the chair and you just get a much better appreciation for you know asking questions or, or being on both sides so excited to to share jake's story today um little bio jake's the founder of okc's first native american owned craft brewery skydance brewing co go follow them on instagram all social media that's down below as well and also his podcast is called brewed with hustle uh entrepreneurial business and leadership podcast which i, I still don't know why you had me on because i'm like i'm not i said it in the podcast didn't i i know when he classifies i was an entrepreneur but like everything i said i guess leads to the definition yeah. but um yeah. you know uh, another thing which i'm looking at the about section on your linkedin profile which is mm-hmm. always the best place to find things Uh-oh. and it says native business magazine top 50 native entrepreneur yeah. recipient when was that uh last year so yeah. it's been about a year ago yeah so it's not something you just had in college and you're like i'm gonna put that on there cause no no that's what my that's my linkedin is full of like some yeah. random things i just had in college <laughs> yeah so uh native business magazine was started by uh gary and carmen davis mm-hmm. so have you ever seen the movie the indian in the cupboard i have not okay so it's a really it, when i was a kid it was a huge a huge movie mm-hmm. here in the states and uh so it was basically this this little Native American toy that uh, this kid put it in a cupboard and then yeah. opened the door and it came to life. Okay. And uh, so as a kid, it was great, right? And so Gary Davis was the little Indian okay. in the cupboard. And so he's a rapper, um, entrepreneur, but he started Native Business Magazine as a way to promote Native American businesses. And uh, their very first... Um, edition of top 50 entre- native entrepreneurs mm-hmm. they had me in the top 50 there you so go. it was pretty cool yeah, yeah. that is really, yeah. especially the first one right yeah, that, yeah. that's really cool yeah. uh so I, like from from chatting to you last week and doing the podcast like i know mm-hmm. the story's awesome and i know there's a great reason behind you starting the brewery yeah. which i think we'll get to later but mm-hmm. let's back up um born and raised oklahoman yep yeah, born and raised. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, you know, where you grew up, what it was like, and then, yeah. you know, being, because I know you're very involved in the, you know, with the Indian and heritage, yeah. and you you know, there's a lot of people, like my family or my in-laws, like, they are, they're, they're an Indian heritage, mm-hmm. but they're not very involved anymore, yeah. whereas yeah. you're still really involved, yeah. which which is yeah. neat. So, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk as much as you want about that. Yeah. Okay. So um, I was raised by a single dad. Uh, my, my dad's white mm-hmm. and my mom's Native American. She's full blood, Iowa, Osage, and Oto. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my grandpa on my mom's side was the chairman of the Iowa tribe for years and years and years. So I enrolled in the Iowa tribe, um, obviously. So, um, But my, my mom and dad split up when I was three years old. My dad raised me and my brother by himself mm-hmm. out in Little Axe, Oklahoma, which is on the east side of Lake Thunderbird. Um, on my dad's side, I come from um, politicians. My grandpa was a state senator, and when he died in the 90s, he was a county assessor for Oklahoma County for a really long time. Um, and then they uh, also had a newspaper. It was an Oklahoma County-wide newspaper. Yeah. So uh, my dad comes from that that kind of background, but he was just an old hippie. He didn't fit, <laughs> he didn't fit into any of that kind of stuff. He was a, he was a rocker. He had yeah. a band back in the day, you know. And so I grew up 
with this this old hippie guy that was just really into doing everything with his hands and creating things. Mm-hmm. He was probably the best uh, leather craftsman I've ever seen in my life. You know, he could build anything out yeah. of leather. Um, people would come to him from everywhere to build a gun holster or a belt, you know. Um, he was great with, uh, like, construction, you know. He uh, he built a, this really cool uh, shop in our house out there in Little Axe, and then we moved to Montana for a while, and he built this house up on a mountain, uh, yeah. which was another whole crazy story. How but, old were uh, you when you moved? So that was the day that we, my ninth grade year in high school, um, the last day of school, literally we got up the next morning and loaded everything up and headed to Montana. Yeah. And uh, we, we'd gotten up there. It was my dad, my uncle. So my grandpa had died a couple years before and left him some money. And they Mm -hmm. just, my dad just always wanted to be, you know, in Alaska or something and just live off the land and do that. And so uh, that was their opportunity. So we took off and we get up there and we're driving up this mountain in the middle of nowhere. It took like from the time we left the bottom of the mountain to towards the top, it was like a 45 minute drive, you know, and I'm like, holy crap, you know, I'm 16 years old or almost 16. It's like, what am I getting into? I'm already missing all my buddies back in Oklahoma. And uh, we get up there and they said, well, here we are. And I look around and all I see is trees, you know, (laughs) and my dad gets a chainsaw out and starts cutting this little path and he cuts out a couple big circles and we set up two big green army tents, like a big giant army tent. And so that was in May and we lived in those tents and, and immediately just started building the house. Oh, it's so good. Uh, and we moved into that house in the middle of October and two weeks after we moved into it, it started snowing and it didn't stop snowing for about six months. <laughs> So it was from Oklahoma to Montana, (laughs) culture shock, you know, but I learned that's where I became a man. You know, I learned how to feed ourselves from, you know, hunting and and how to live a more simple life, you know, and how to really create things that you need in life from your hands, you know. And so that was really uh, that was that was pretty much it you know and we 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 lived there for two years and came back to oklahoma and uh and uh you know went on with our with our lives do you miss it oh man yeah i go back every year used to house us live. yeah yeah i go back there every year and uh so we don't we don't we don't have the 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 house anymore the the couple that bought it from my parent from my dad uh has it now but we um I, when my dad died several years ago, um, I took his ashes up there yeah. on that mountain and put him in the creek. That, that we had a creek that ran through our property. And so when I was a kid up there and, my, and we were hungry, right? Dad, we're hungry. You know, we want to go Pizza Hut or whatever, right? right? He'd hand us a fly rod and he'd say, go get you some food. And we'd go out in this little creek and catch trout and we ended up loving it, you know? Yeah. And so my dad, I always tell people my dad was... Um, you know, when you're a single dad and you give up everything to raise two boys on your own, mm. you battle with depression. That's something that's easy to battle with, you know. And um, a lot of my childhood, I saw dad being, you know, just super depressed and not not the happiest guy. But those two years in Montana yeah. are the only time in my life I can remember seeing my dad just in completely happy. Damn. And he would... I'd wake up in the morning and he wouldn't be in the house. And so I'd go out to that creek and he'd be sitting there on the creek side on a rock, just uh, drinking his coffee and just smiling and just yeah. looking around, you know. And at the time, I didn't know what the heck that was, you know. Like, what is he smiling about? This sucks, right. you know. <laughs> yeah, him in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. And by the time we left, I just got to really appreciate it. And now, like, I, when we go back every year, we disappear up into those mountains for yeah. a week, you know. We'll backpack up and either float down the river coming back or we'll just camp out up there for a week and fish and just kind of yeah. disappear from everything. Get, I always try to pick a place where the phones don't work you know right and uh now i get it now i understand what yeah he, like what that liked. that sounds like that sounds like a movie right like yeah. it's like all the things that you've just said you're like yep. that sounds like you're describing a movie because yeah. it doesn't sound real yeah. right like, yeah for someone to do that now yeah i mean i'm sure people do but with everything going on and even just to find you know mm-hmm. it's getting harder and harder to find a place where your phone doesn't work yeah but yeah. 
going back every year that's that's special yeah yeah so. yeah we definitely we've and we've made it a tradition you know so we go back every september so here in a few weeks we'll be heading yeah. back up there and this year is the first year that we're taking the kids so it's you know normally we go back up in these mountains so deep in the mountains and my son was little mm -hmm. and the last thing i wanted him to, first off the hike is tough you know yeah. for a little kid but then you know the grizzly bears and cats and you know that kind of stuff so i just didn't feel safe really taking them that deep yeah. into these places but this, so this year's the first year so we'll see how that goes yeah <laughs> and we're like calling in a helicopter yeah. guys yeah. i need yeah. some help they'll be, they'll be doing the same thing i said we're not plug the xbox uh, yeah. in you know? yeah exactly <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You're like, uh, what's going on? Yeah. yeah. I'm cold. Well, strike strike a yeah. fire up, but put, put a sweater on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it reminds yeah. me of that movie. Talk about movies. It reminds me of that. Uh, is it without a paddle? The movie, the comedy movie with Seth Green. Oh yeah. <laughs> like yeah. they go into the woods yeah. to find like this guy's yeah. treasure or whatever, and, <laughs> and they're like fetal position, yeah. fetal position. Yeah. It's like oh, cuddling a bear. <laughs> My scariest moment in Montana had nothing to do with a bear or a mountain lion. It was I got chased by a beaver. Uh, really? Yeah. And they so, quick? Yeah. So I'm I'm on the me and my dad went fishing and we're I'm out. I found this great beaver pond where it's really built up in deep water and I was catching really big brown trout and I like every other day I had to go out there because I just loved it so much and there's this tree laying out across the water and I'd sit on this tree and it was floating and I just sit there and catch fish and these beavers you'd see them from time to time mm. but uh, next thing I know my butt got wet and it. The log went down into the water, and I lifted back up, and I looked down at the end. I'm trying to bring this fish in at the time, yeah. you know, and I looked down at the end of the log, and there's this beaver that was climbing up onto the log, and he was so big that he was sinking part of this log, <laughs> and I'm like, what in the hell is this? And so I slowly start getting up. Well, he slowly starts coming towards me, and I've got this fish in my hand. I'm trying to get the hook out, and here he comes. Just he, He's on a dead sprint for me. Yeah. And I rip the hook out of that fish, and I put the fish in my pocket, <laughs> and I take <laughs> off running down this log, and I I jumped. I mean, I was Michael Jordan, dude. I, <laughs> I jumped. I, it had to have been like 20 feet, you know, yeah. to get over onto the bank. And here he's still coming after me, and I go running through the woods. I finally find my dad, and he's like, "What's wrong with you?" I said, "Don't go back there." He's like, "Is it a bear? A moose?" I'm like, "No, it's a beaver." He's like, "What?" <laughs> I never lived that down the rest of the time we lived in Montana. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant! And I'm sure there's so many more stories like that too. Like that's you just get that from being away for yep. so long and being up in the country, and and you know, especially coming from Oklahoma and yep. going into the mountains. It, it just you yeah. know, even a hill is like amazing yeah. right we're going deep into the mountains yeah. and have been living in a house that you just watch and build yeah. watch your dad build or help him build mm -hmm. it's all it was always really an adventure man there yeah. was our exit from the place involved a gunfight <laughs> <laughs> literally involved a gunfight yeah so these kids that were partying up the mountain they knew somebody up there that had land. They were partying, and they were throwing litter all over our land on the way by. Yeah. And so my dad and my uncle said they'd had enough. So they drove up there to this party and confronted them and told them, hey, we don't mind you guys up here partying, but pick your trash up on the way back. And I guess yeah. it got kind of heated, and they came, they came back home. Well, those kids got mad, I guess. And the next thing you know, we hear gunshots outside. And we look out the window, and you could see across the road from us in the woods, you could see the flash yeah. from the gun. They're shooting at our house. You can hear the bullets hitting the house. And so my uncle shoots his shotgun up in the sky to yeah. kind of let them know, hey, we got, we got guns, we got too. too yeah. Well, they just kept shooting. Jeez. And so my dad and uncle went out there and kind of ran them off. They went back up the mountain, and then they come back down in their cars and shooting the whole way down. My uncle jumps out of the way and shoots a tire out of this Jeez. car yeah. and they kept going down the mountain my dad and uncle chased them down the mountain <laughs> and they kind of wrecked up on top of this rock they kind of high centered up on this rock and uh my uncle jumped up on the hood of this car and pulled the kid out through yeah. the windshield and hog tied him threw him in the back of the truck and called the police <laughs> Said you need to come get these guys. Well, that kid's dad was the police chief. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, Small town. Uh, yeah, we we weren't real popular people in town. Yeah, you were the you were the out of towners yeah, at that Okies. point. Yeah. People in Montana don't like people from out of state coming yeah. up there. They want they just want it all to themselves. They like that it's the way it is. You know, yeah. no population and quiet. Which is why I like going up there right. too. You know. So. Yeah.
yeah it must be hard to build like to get into that community right yeah for, you know for if, if it's done that's how it's done the whole way and mm-hmm. the, you know like everyone knows everybody and then somebody comes yep. in and they've all been there for generations yeah. you know so yeah, yeah. it it's, was hard to fit in oh but, and, but still i mean what what an experience what memories you have from that mm-hmm. i mean now you have traditionally you go back every year yeah that's yeah. really cool wouldn't give it up for anything yeah so when do you move back to Oklahoma then? So, so literally, it was two years after we got there. We mm-hmm. moved back to Oklahoma, um, and I'm in the second half of my junior year of high school, and um, you know, got to come back to the same place we lived at before. You Nothing's know, changed. I was excited, you know, to be back, and yeah. you know, I played sports, so I was happy to be back with all my buddies and playing ball with them and all that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. you know. So, um, yeah, it was. Uh, only two years, but so learned, many memories learned a lot. in those two yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. So you come back, you're playing sports in high school, and 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 then I guess graduate and go to college. Yeah. So um, when I when I first when I first graduated high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I had like some partial scholarship offers to play uh, basketball and at small small schools and mm-hmm. stuff, you know. And so I I gave that a little try at a couple little schools and all my buddies were going to OU and partying and hanging out and stuff, yeah. you know. So I was like, you know, I'm not going to sit on the bench and not play anymore. So I'm going to uh, go to go to OU and, and yeah. party and hang out. And uh, so, but real quick, I learned what I wanted to do was like what we're doing right now. I wanted to be on the radio. Okay. And uh, I wanted to be on ESPN or, or, you know, sports talk radio, that kind of stuff. I was just a sports junkie. Yeah. And so um, I, ha- I had some friends who were going to this broadcasting school, and it was just a quicker, easier way, mm-hmm. you know. And so I uh, left I left college and, and went to broadcasting school and graduated from that and then went on another adventure up to Woodward, Oklahoma, and worked at a country radio station up there and uh, yeah. did a little sports play-by-play, high school sports. That's really what I'd gone up there for. So, yeah. yeah, which, like, that's that's a real skill. I I would yeah. I would be so, if somebody threw me in the deep end and said even talk like I, I obviously I play golf so even commentating mm-hmm. on golf something that I know I've known my entire life yeah. if somebody said to me tomorrow you are going to commentate on a live golf tournament yeah. I mean that's that's hard work yeah yeah and then golf's easy I mean golf's a slower sport mm-hmm. so it should be theoretically easier to yeah. commentate on you're talking play by play with football yeah. and basketball like that's some serious stuff yeah so you have you have play by play and then you have color. Okay. And so the play by play is the guy that's, I mean, it's every play. He's telling you the guy ran left, the guy yeah. ran right. You know, he's telling you every move that Everybody's happened. Everybody's jersey name, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. What I did was the color. So I was the, the color commentator. So I was just kind of off to the side that, you know, after a play was over, I'd give my opinion of okay. what just happened. You know, so that that's the a easier. A lot more personality in it then. Yeah, yeah. It's more like um, you definitely have to know the sport. You have to know what you're talking about, yeah. but it's a little. To me, it was just easier. You know, the play-by-play was easy to mess up. You yeah. know, and you have to. Those guys really get in the zone. You know, I, I always. Uh, I'm a big OU fan, so like the the guys, the Bob Berry seniors, and the people who were the play-by-play voices for OU football, mm-hmm. man, are like some of the most talented people you'll ever see. For them to be able to do that, like, is incredible to me, and yeah. I loved that. I just wasn't as good at that, you know. So I, it's a serious skill. Yeah, the it? color commentary was more my yeah. thing, but. Uh, now, come to find out, really, radio just wasn't my, you know, there wasn't yeah. any money in it, so. Yeah, which, I mean, is there money in it now, or, or was it just not, was it I a timing if, thing for you? Th- yeah, think? it was a timing thing. I think, like, if you, if you're the, if you are a big name, especially in talk radio, mm-hmm. so sports talk or po- politics, if you're a big personality, a former famous athlete or whatever, there's a lot of money to be made in it, Um Radio is not not quite as bad as newspaper business. That's kind yeah. of really faded away, but it is. You know, it's not quite what it used to be. Sure. You know, when I was a kid, I loved listening to a baseball game on the radio mm. or whatever. But now it's it, it's so easy to watch a game on TV. Everybody right. everybody has satellite or cable or streaming TV now. But um, for me back then, the other issue at that time was I just had my daughter. Mm-hmm. And she lived with her mom back down here, actually in Shawnee. And so I was driving back to Oklahoma City um, 
basically every other weekend yeah. to see her, and I'd stay at my dad's or whatever while while I had her, and then it just got to be too much, and I wasn't making any money. Like, yeah. I mean, it was literally I had to do a, a I hosted a radio show um, in the afternoons playing country music, and before that, I, in the mornings, I would record commercials yeah. or get ready for whatever football game we're doing that night and all that stuff, and then I'd go out and do that football game, not get home till midnight, and then get up the next morning. You know, it was just a lot of yeah. hours. But yet, I mean, I think my paycheck was like 500 bucks yeah. every two weeks. Like you the know? paid hours that you would do. Yeah, I couldn't afford to, to live yeah. off of it, you know. Yeah. So I go into the owner's office, the guy that owned the station. And um, I told him, I said, I need a raise, man. I told him my situation. I've got my daughter. Mm. Uh, I'm doing a lot more driving back and forth than I ever thought I'd do. And, and he said, man, he goes, we just don't really pay much to the on-air talent around here. Yeah. He said, if you want to make some extra money, go back there in that sales department and see if they need any help. Mm -hmm. And so I went back there, and those guys handed me this folder. And... I didn't realize it at the time. I thought they were just helping me out, but they were laughing inside. Yeah. And they had handed me the folder of all the dead leads, like the, all the, the cells that they've been hitting them up. These people in, been in town, they've been hitting them up for years about advertisement, and they just never bit, right? Yeah. And so they handed me 12 leads. And I, I think I came back. It was a week and a half later. I came back, and I'd sold five of them. And I was disappointed. Yeah. I thought I was supposed to sell them all. Right. I thought I, was, I didn't know they were the dead leads first off, and I didn't know much about sales. Which I didn't mentally know. makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I just went out. Yeah, I had the ignorance. You yeah, know, I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. And so I, I come back and I sold, and they had this look on their face of disbelief, you know. And so I started selling advertisement and and doing the on air stuff, mm -hmm. and but I started realizing the money was in sales. And I was pretty good at sales. And uh, so I moved back to Oklahoma, back down to Norman, and uh, got in the car business. Yeah. <laughs> Started yeah. selling cars and making real money. Which it, it makes like, you know, when looking back at it, it makes sense that like you were naturally good at sales because going to radio first, mm -hmm. right, you just build up, you could talk to anyone, you could talk, and yeah. you know, you're so comfortable on air talking to whoever yeah. it is. That when someone says, "Oh, here's a here's a book," like, mm -hmm. go sell these people, like it's it's, it's natural. It's interesting. I, 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 you well, know, it's I've a skill that you've developed for a long time. Yeah, you as you knew. And you I've had. had several careers in my life that's led me to where I'm at now. And mm -hmm. I feel like every one of those careers and different things I've done have have taught me something that's mm -hmm. absolutely crucial to what I do now. Yeah. And that was the first. The radio business was the first one. It was the first thing because, so my fiance Bobby is an introvert. And we talk about that all the time, yeah. you know, because I, I have more, I'm more of an open personality. I can make friends with anybody. Mm -hmm. And she's just super introvert and shy. And she doesn't ever believe me when I tell her that when I was in high school and younger, I was an introvert. Yeah. So my natural being is I'm an introvert. We're the same way. And, I was the same way. But mm -hmm. I've had to learn through the different yeah. careers I've had, I've had to learn how to be, right. you know, more, more, have more of a voice. Yeah. And um, so the radio, radio business was the start of it. It was the first thing that kind of taught me how to come out of my shell. Yeah. So, so then you go into the wild, wild game of selling cars. Yeah. So. Um, Which, what year is that you were trying to sell okay, cars? Okay. So that would have been like, oh, okay. Yeah. So this was either late 2000 or mm. early 2001. And, and the reason I remember that is because it wasn't, but maybe if, so it had to have been early 01 because just a few months, just months after that, 9-11 mm -hmm. happened. Okay. And the car business was hit really hard by 9-11. Mm -hmm. I can just, I can remember. So we sold, the dealership I worked at, we sold trucks. Yeah. And, you know, Ford, it was a Ford dealership. We sold big old F-250s and 350s, ga gas guzzlers. Mm. Well, like literally the day after 9-11, gas prices everywhere were like five bucks a gallon. And you could yeah. see stores that had like $8 a gallon. And even though that got fixed over a few days, it was still, I mean, we've never seen, right. only only a few times we've seen it get under a mm. dollar or even under $2, Yeah, you know, yeah. since then. It's always been high since then. So... When that happened and everybody was freaking out, it's kind of like now, kind of like what we're dealing with now. The economy was uncertain, and and those the car sales just 
went just tanked, you know, and I was just starting to figure it out. Um, luckily, they came out with that's when they started doing zero percent interest on cars, and so people were like, oh yeah, I gotta yeah. buy a truck now if it's zero percent interest, you know. Right, so, my payments only this much. Great, yeah, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, oh one in that in that area. Yeah. yeah, and just got hooked from day one selling. Um, <clears throat> I hated it. Yeah. So, and I did this for a, quite a while, eight years or so, but. I hated um, I hated it and loved it at the same time. Hated the hours? Yeah, I hated the yeah. hours. Remember, I'm an OU fan. Yeah. Well, you work on Saturdays in the car business. Biggest if day of the You week. can call off on Monday, Wednesday, but you do not call off on yeah. Saturday. And I'm and I'm and when I say I'm an OU fan, I'm crazy OU fan. Yeah. I like, you don't want to watch a football game. With, nobody wants to watch like a football game. Like, the entire day is for oh, the game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah dude. Yeah. So, like, the first game of the year is like yeah. a religious event for me. Yeah. You know? And, uh, like, I'll literally wake up. I'm, I go to bed the night before with my OU shirt on. I'll get up in the morning and I'll have my first beer by 10, yeah. 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. And I've got everything Grilling OU out. out. Everything, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but, anyways, so I couldn't go to OU games. When I was in the car business, I hated that, um, but I was hooked on the rush of landing a sale, mm-hmm. you know. And I had this sales manager at the time who was real big on um, he studied sales, like he was real into sales and mindset Tactics. and yeah, yeah, and that kind of stuff. And he was a great guy, just a really good guy. And he had a different approach to sales than what a lot of people you hear about in the car business, you know. And so he introduced me to um, a guy that I would listen to named Zig Ziglar. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got hooked on Zig Ziglar at that time. And so I really just started studying that positivity and mindset and sales and and how to treat customers and how to be of of service to them and not trying to talk them into buying buying something. You're just you're there to help them. The cliche car sales. Yeah. Yeah. everyone hates yeah right yeah Yeah. and so i I enjoyed that part of it but again you know i'm in my 20s you know i hated the hours yeah um but at some point in time so my first month man i think i made like 800 dollars, and i was like what in the hell am i doing like i'm I'm, i can't survive on this and the next month i made ten thousand dollars ten grand in a month for a guy that's in his early 20s yeah and i thought i was the boss yeah you know and so right from once i started making consistent i didn't consistently make 10 grand but i consistently made more money than most of my friends right right and more than most of my friends that had college degrees and all this stuff but once you get to where you're making that kind of money and it's hard to leave mm-hmm. Mainly because wh- where else are you going to go make sure. that kind of money, you know, if you if you're not a doc, you know, a doctor, right? Because the resume says, yeah. you know, it doesn't. It's yeah. not a. Hey, I can go, I can go back yeah. to radio and make yeah. five hundred dollars every two weeks again. You yeah, know? but uh, so that was that was I like I like the money. I like the sales aspect of it. You kind of trapped. I hated the hours. Kind of trapped at the time. Yeah, though. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's a that's a typical thing in the car business. Guy, car guys will tell you they they get trapped in the car business. Yeah. And I never would have left the car business probably, but my dad got sick, so sure. Um, somebody had to take care of him, so I. So I that's quit. why you left. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what? So if dad's not very well, uh, but during this whole time, like, are you do you have like a passion for craft beer this whole time? So the craft beer thing went goes even goes back. Okay. In time. So when I was a kid, I told you my dad, you know, was everything was with his hands, right? Yeah. And he was this interesting guy. So my dad would um so he couldn't just go buy a can of Folgers coffee, right? Yeah. He had to go at that time there was a place, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but there was a co- there was basically one place in Oklahoma City. Java Dave's was the name of it. And it was actually an automobile alley about two blocks north of our building that we're moving into okay. pretty soon. But Java Dave's was a place you could go get like all kinds of coffee stuff, like guys that were into good coffee. You could yeah. get good beans. You could get like, you, I think you could even buy like a small roaster and all this stuff. Um, and so my dad was just really into doing that kind of stuff and making coffee the hard way, mm-hmm. right? Um, he was into, like I said, the leather work. When we when we fished, you know, he had to fly fish and not only yeah. that, but like he couldn't just go buy flies. He had to tie his own. So he taught me how to do that. Everything was craft, 
Everything for him was a craft, right? Mm -hmm. He was just really old soul type guy. And uh, so beer was the same way. He hated, in Oklahoma especially, like you couldn't get good beer in Oklahoma. And it would be import beer was what he would drink if he did buy beer. But by the time beer gets from Europe to here, it's just not the same, you know. And so he started making beer. And uh, he, uh, he, he had this batch of beer. I think it was an Oktoberfest or something. And he had it sitting over in this big glass carboy. And I went over and opened it one day and played with it. And I was 12 years old at the time. And I messed it up. And uh, it got infected. And so he said, man, i got to teach you what this is all about just so you just so i would know sure. kind of, to not do that you know i would kind of appreciate it and understand it and so i uh i went over there and started helping him brew after that you know yeah. and got real into i just thought it was real cool you know it's like there's this grain you know and hops yeah. and stuff and then the next thing you know people are drinking it out of a glass and it was just like wow it's cool you know my son good. my son when he the first time he helped me he, he said it was magic yeah you know it's like magic and it is you know it's really it's just something there's something about making your own beer and then ha- watching people enjoy it yeah just like there's something about the first time I tied a fly and then caught a fish on that fly with a fly rod, you right. know, and uh, I still have that fly. It was my dad caught a fish on it to show me that it would work. Yeah. And then I caught a fish on it, and then my son caught his first trout yeah. on a fly rod with that same fly. So, so I still have that. There's I something love, about making that, like that, you know. Yeah. So so you quit the car thing. So mm-hmm. you, you know you got to go take care of dad. What are you doing for work at that time then? So, you know, I was making good money in the car business. So I had some money saved up. um, And then I I moved in with my dad, uh, left my apartment, which was just a sweet, a sweet bad dude. But, <laughs> You're enjoying life, oh yeah, right? dude. I'm living in downtown yeah. Oklahoma City, you know, and it's just like I'm walking over to Top Works to have beer every yeah. night after work. I was loving it. But, um, you know, my dad, so I, my, I got a call that my dad had had a stroke. And uh, so I went to go check on him. And he, he kind of had signs of a stroke, mm-hmm. but I wasn't sure. And so I take him to the hospital. And then, long story short, he's, I mean, he's in the hospital for days and days and days. They're trying to figure out what's wrong with him. It wasn't a stroke. And it turned out he had M- MS. Mm-hmm. And so they gave him some treatment. It kind of brought him back a little bit to where he was somewhat normal. Um, and he moved back home, so I was like, I got to go take care of We tried for a week or two to let him be on his own, and he just would fall yeah. and stuff or call, like, not knowing where he's at, you know. So I moved home. I quit my job, stayed with him. You couldn't, couldn't leave him alone. Right. You know, like yeah. he would fall or hurt himself or do something, you know. And so I'm living off my savings. Um, Dad, at that point, is on, like, disability, you know. So mm-hmm. that's paying a lot of the bills around the house and buying groceries and stuff. And, I mean, yeah. it was tough. It was I did that for nine months until I mean he just progressively got worse and yeah. worse you know in the beginning we thought man he's gonna get better they're gonna treat him and he'll be okay he might just have to not ever work again but he'll but literally within eight or nine months it was just I'm having to bathe him I'm having yeah. to clean him up in the restroom I'm having to you know he would go out the telltale thing was he went outside to sit on the porch one day and he would go out there and smoke a cigarette and drink his coffee. And I went out there and he had the cigarette in his hand and n- never lit it. Yeah. And so I asked him, you know, what, you, you're not going to smoke anymore, you know? And he said, uh, he said, Jake, I can't remember how to light my cigarette. Yeah. He just couldn't remember how to do it. And uh, so I, that's when I knew just things were getting bad. And eventually we just had to put him in a nursing home, you know. Yeah. We just like, I'd. It's like, that's like the worst thing. It's a terrible disease. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean I'll just, never, I can just, I can remember him being, we took him to the nursing home and he was showing him around, letting him see the place. And he's in a wheelchair at this yeah. point. And then he says, uh, all right, Jake, let's go. We got to go home. I got to go check yeah. on the house. And me and my it's brother are just like, you. oh my gosh, like, how do we leave him here? Yeah. And so we knew a guy that ran the nursing home, and it was in Tecumseh, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And so I, because I knew the guy, 
um, that's why we wanted to put him put him in there. Because, yeah. you know, everybody's scared of nursing homes, dude. Like, are they going to get treated right and all that kind of stuff? And so I, I went and rented a house in Tecumseh and moved to Tecumseh just so I could be, I could go yeah. in there every day. I mean, this is a guy that raised me by himself. Right. And, like, he was my hero. And More like an older brother. Yeah. And I yeah. hadn't, there was never... I can't remember any extended period of times I didn't see him. Right. You know, so I couldn't just put him in a nursing home and leave him there. You, you know? You'd never forgive yourself yeah. for it. I had to be somewhere yeah. where I could go see him like almost every day. Right. You know, and that's for the longest time it was every day. But he was, this is, he's 56 years old yeah. when he got sick. And now he's in this nursing home. And, um, I would just go in there and hang out with him and watch John Wayne movies and stuff yeah. and just hang out, you know. And, and he just slowly, slowly got worse, yeah. you know. But he was in there for five years. You must have had some really good conversations, though. Yeah, except for he just – there were some good conversations in the fact that sometimes he didn't know who I was <laughs> or really where he was <laughs> so at. So he'd tell you how he really felt yeah, sometimes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes he thought I was his brother yeah. because I know I look a lot like my uncle did. Yeah. But um, one of the funniest things was he was in the cafeteria eating, and they said he's in there. So I go in there, and I sit down next to him, and he's he, he looked mad this day, right? And he's shaking his head, you know, and, he, and I was like, Dad, what's going on? on man he goes i quit man i quit and that kind of concerned me i was like man what do you mean you're quitting you're yeah. giving up you know like what does that mean and he goes this job he goes i just don't <laughs> like it he's like he, goes, he said uh i don't think they appreciate me around here <laughs> he said he goes i don't think they, they don't pay me enough he goes Hell, I don't know if they're paying me at all. <laughs> and I said, "Well, tell them you're quitting, Dad. Just tell yeah. them, tell them to shove it." You know. <laughs> he said, "I think I will." <laughs> you know, he went back to eating and went about his day. But yeah, he thought he was at work. That's so, so funny. So that's where, and then because we've spoken previously, and then you know, from from a couple of weeks ago, we did the podcast. Like that is where the brewery comes yeah. from. So. So, so okay, so we go back. You know, Dad was always teaching me how to brew a little bit. Well, then when I when I got out of high school and my days living in Norman at OU and stuff, I worked at a place called Coaches okay. in Norman, and it was a brewery. Um, it now it's called the Norman Brew House, and back then it was a restaurant and a brewery. And so I started out. I got a job there bartending, and I ended up becoming a, a manager there. But um, my dad at the time worked for the city of Norman. And when they would get off work, they'd come over and hang out while I was bartending or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I'd get off work, and I'd sit there with my dad and drink beer, and we'd look around at all the tanks and stuff in there. We talked about how yeah. it'd be cool to have a place like that, but we'd do it this way or we'd do this different. You know, we had all these ideas, and we'd, you know, we just talked about it all the time. Sure. We'd go to bars where there's a lot of craft beer, and we'd sit down and talk about how cool it would be mm -hmm. to have our beer there. Like Tapworks, you know, was a the last time I ever actually went out with my dad was at Tapworks before he got sick. Because I was living downtown, and he, I find, dude, like his whole life, he never called off work, not yeah. once. And this time, for whatever reason, when I asked him, "Hey, call off work, let's go have a beer," for some reason, he did. And um, so we're sitting at Tapworks, and somebody came up and ordered a beer, and uh, we were like, "Man, there's no Oklahoma breweries. Why is that?" You know. Yeah. And uh, we talked about how cool it would be to be sitting there, and if some guy came up and ordered your beer while you're sitting there, you know, how yeah. cool would that be? And uh, and so, you know, long story short on that part was that's the first account I ever got with Skydance. Yeah. And I, I remember going in there, Garrett, who's the manager there, um, you know, I brought him all these beers, and then he put three of them on tap. Yeah, And so I walk out to my Jeep and I was just in tears, you know, because I just remember dad, you know, like that, that moment yeah. of us sitting there dreaming this up, you know. So, um, so yeah, so dad, I kind of was back and forth on home brewing. I'd brew a little bit mm -hmm. and then I, then I wouldn't brew for several months, you know. And then um, while dad was in the nursing home right before he died, I'm going through a lot of his stuff or cleaning out his old house and stuff. And I find this book and it's on home brewing. And it's a real famous home brewing book by a guy named Charlie Papazian. He's like the godfather of home brewing. Mm. And I'm like, oh man, I can't believe he has this book. You know, I didn't know. And I'm thumbing through it and there's this 
piece of paper folded up in there and it was a like a grocery list but it was beer ingredients yeah. and what dad would do was like if i wanted to brew beer he would give me a list and i would go to this brew shop that was in norman at the time and i would get this stuff and come back and we'd make beer and uh so this was one of those lists and, right. and i could tell by looking at the ingredients that it was an oatmeal stout and i i'm like okay i'm gonna make this beer and take it to the nursing home and let him let him enjoy something you know and so i made the beer i took it in there and he just loved it you know he's like oh man that's good he said who made that i said you did no i was like yeah yeah that's your beer and uh he said that's 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 real good and he he drank the whole he drank that whole beer and i got kicked out of the nursing home that day because i brought beer into the nursing home <laughs> and i'm like what is what's he gonna do die yeah, you know? exactly <laughs> like come on yeah, yeah and so uh and so I, I couldn't come back for a day or something i can't remember what it was yeah. but anyways i take some some of that beer to this homebrew comp or a homebrew uh club meeting and uh, there's a club called the Red Earth Brewers, and that's a, it's still a, a club mm-hmm. here in Oklahoma City. And so I go to this meeting, and all the people that are trying the beers and stuff are uh, drinking it, and they're just like, wow, man, this is really good. And one of them says, you know, there's this big competition um, that, that takes place down in Dallas, and you need to send your beer off mm-hmm. down to this thing. And so I send it off down there. And really I send it off because I was, I was really starting to get into brewing again, and I was like... I wanted the the I wanted the score sheet back. I was constructive. Wanted, yeah, I just wanted yeah, to figure I wanted out some what feedback you need to do next. because yeah. in person, even in the club meetings, you know, yeah. most of the people will just to your face or oh yeah, that's great. It's the you Oklahoma know? thing. And yeah, yeah, everyone's too yeah, nice. Everybody's really nice, yeah, so. which is horrible if yeah. you're a salesman. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, and like your family, your friends, yeah. nobody's gonna tell you the beer sucks. Yeah. You know, you want real feedback. Yeah, and so I send it off to Dallas and. Then it's like a month and a half or two months later, they have the the actual, it, it's really, this one, is, it's the second largest um, homebrew competition in the country, I okay. think. And um, it's like a three-day event. And so everybody from the club goes down there mm-hmm. on like Thursday night or Friday, and they hang out for several days and go to this conference, yeah. and then there's like this awards ceremony on Saturday. And so we went down, but then Saturday morning, I had to drive back to Oklahoma City, get on a plane, fly to Phoenix for a gaming conference, because at this time, I'm in the casino business. Working for the tribe. Yeah, working for the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma. And so we have this big, it's a national Indian gaming conference every year. And this, this particular year, it was in Phoenix. And so I fly to Phoenix. And while I'm on the flight, is during, is they're having the awards ceremony, mm-hmm. you know. And um, I land, and Gail, who owns the brew shop here in Oklahoma City, she was down there. She leaves a voicemail on my phone. She says, you won a medal. You won, you won. And I was real excited, you know. I was like, man, Dad's beer, man. Like, yeah. he won. He finally gets some recognition for yeah. something, you know. And uh, I was just super excited. I couldn't wait to get back home. And I was going to take, you know, take his uh, medal and put it in his room at the at the nursing home and stuff. But I get to my hotel room. My brother calls and says, Dad just passed away. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, man. he. I, it was good, you know, he, he was suffered for a long time. So it was good that he that it was over. The suffering mm-hmm. was over, but it was also good that he won. Right, this you award. just wanted yeah, to be able to tell before him. he died, you yeah. know. And so um, I'm sitting in Phoenix, man, and I'm with my boss and our tribal chairman, and I'm just telling them, you know, what had just happened. I'm trying to get a flight back to Oklahoma so we can get the arrangements taken care of and stuff and um one of them had mentioned something like man you you always talk about how you're gonna open a brewery you know what happened and it made me think like we talked about it and you can't just talk about stuff forever because it just ends up not happening we we all think we have a long time to do stuff we all think we're gonna live forever and stuff but here's a guy who at 56 years old is just young yeah and he's in a nursing home you know, and I thought I had another 10, 15, 20 years to do right. these kinds of things with him, you know, yeah. but you wait and wait and wait. And the next thing you know, you're out of time. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to start a brewery, but I'm going to make sure that I don't run out of time. And the way I'm going to do that is give myself a deadline. Yeah. 
And so I told myself that I'm going to have a, a deadline of I'm gonna be 40 years old, yeah. and I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have my brewery open by the time I turn 40. And so uh, I'm 35 at the time. And I start. I kind of got a plan. I'm gonna spend a couple of years just brewing beer, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna do all the you know get these beers perfect, all the ones that would do good in a brewery, you know, and um, and then I'm gonna kind of put together a business plan and then raise some money and I'll have it, have it open by the time I'm 40. And yeah. so, uh, we brewed our first, or I turned, I turned 40 in October of 2018. And then we brewed our first batch about three weeks later yeah. in here. So just, just pretty much made it. Oh yeah. yeah. But the thing yeah. is, if you don't say yourself that deadline, you might not have happened today, you yeah. know, we're two years later and you still wouldn't yeah. have had it. Right. So that's like, that's a lesson for everyone listening that was like, Time is running out. Yeah, like go do something like today, tomorrow. Like, yeah, today's not over until yeah. You, today's so not I, over I learned a big. What I learned, I learned a big lesson. So I carry this coin around with me. Yeah, that says memento mori, and it's a, basically a Greek saying that says you could leave life right now. Ryan Holiday, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's basically it's a reminder. I carry it in my pocket every day. Yeah. And every time I grab my keys, every time I do something, I fill that coin in there. Or sometimes I'll just get it out and play around with it, you know. Yeah. But it always reminds me that you could die today. Yeah. You could die right now. And if you just think about how different your life would be if you lived knowing that today's probably your last day. Yeah. Like what are the things you would do? What would you do different if you knew today was your last day, you know? And so I didn't, what I didn't want to do was as much as I admired my dad, he was known for always saying one of these days. Okay. One of these days we're going to go to Alaska. Hmm. One of these days we're going to open a brewery. One, everything was one of these days and they never happened, you know? And so I didn't want to be on my deathbed in a nursing home. And be saying, you know, I wish I'd have done something sure. because I would go into these to the nursing home to see him, and there would be all these old people sitting in there all the time, and I would talk to them, and every single one of them had a story, yeah, about or regret, or whatever. Yeah, it, yeah. it was always something like, man, I was going to do this, or yeah. and I always wanted to do this business, or 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 go to this place, and they never did, yeah. you know, and so I just. Uh, I really just decided that I didn't want to be like that, you know, and I didn't want to be in a nursing home when I'm 56, 56 yeah. years old saying, I wish I'd have done something. Yeah. So, um, I just set, the, set the deadline and made, made it happen. And I told everybody I was going to do it. Yeah. That's the real hard thing to do. Isn't yeah. it? It's like, if you're really going to do this, you're going to commit to yeah. this and then you're going to tell everybody. So yeah. you have all that accountability mm-hmm. on you and all that weight on your shoulders. Yeah. Like, well, I can't back out now because I'm going to make yeah. myself look like an idiot. And for five for five years, I caught I caught hell all the time. Yeah, because people like, oh, here he goes talking about his brewery again. Because that's, I first off, yeah, I knew that if I told people, if I that would hold me accountable. Yeah, you know, peer pressure type thing, right? Right. But then also, I'm a sales guy, right? You never know who you're talking to. That's very true. That might help you get where you need to be. Yeah. You know, on the financial side of it, you know. So I told everybody that would listen about this idea for the brewery, Mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah. And here we are. Yeah. So here we are. So we're currently in the Brewers Union in Oklahoma City, but you just mentioned earlier that your new building's Mm -hmm. opening up on Broadway very soon, right? Yep. So, so we we're the Brewers Union's a co-op brewery where uh-huh. we just kind of get started. It's a place for us to brew and get our beer out in the market while we're waiting on our building. So we we signed a lease on a building on Seventh Street, uh-huh. um, east of Broadway in Automobile Alley. It's just north of like Eote Coffee. Yeah. Uh, the parlor is over there across the street from sure. us, and then we're just a block south of Prairie. The Prairie Artisan Ells, which right is in the middle of it. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we're like the, so let's see, there's us, Prairie, Vanessa House, and Twisted Spike. So that there's four of us in Automobile Alley. Yeah. And then just really close to us is like Elk Valley and Stone Cloud. And I mean, there's right. seven, eight breweries all within a real short distance. Which of now each other. are all Oklahoma breweries. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so like Vanessa House and Angry Scotsman and Elk Valley all came out of here, out yeah. of the Brewers Union as well. So, um, yeah, our goal is actually, um, so, okay, so everybody always wants to know what's going on at the building. And so I have a vlog that we do every week 
for Skydance, and it's really aimed at just letting people come along the journey yeah. and kind of updates on what's going on or whatever. So, but I'm gonna say something now that I've not told anybody yet uh, is our goal. We we believe we're gonna be brewing beer in December. Okay. In this building, and so what we're gonna do is get the production side open first, so we can start brewing beer and keep beer going out in the market. Mm-hmm. Our distribution's gotten a lot bigger than we thought it would be at this point, and then have the tap room open by you know february march at the latest Mm -hmm. um and then that's when we hope to have our grand opening and all that kind of stuff and actually we're gonna have our wedding in there Uh, no way yeah so that'll be like our first event in the in the new tap room is me and bobby getting married congrats that'd be awesome yeah yeah so i mean i finished mine very quickly we just been drinking the new drink right now Mm -hmm. which is the res dog blonde uh on strawberries, strawberries which yeah. is like yeah that was good yeah i mean Fruity, i kind of I, I kind of just want <laughs> to drive home quick. but i kind of want to drink yeah. another one right <laughs> um you know that that was really good um but obviously that's not the only one you have how many yep. do we have right now and kind of what is like the plan yeah for so um, our plan is to basically have um like six year-round beers um I mean, my, my favorite style of beers are IPAs, and that's mm-hmm. what we do the best. So our number one beer that we sell the most of that's really kind of built a name for us and it's pretty responsible for building our new building is Fancy Dance. Okay. Uh, it's a New England IPA, juicy, hazy beer. Just uh, That's the style right now that everybody loves. Yeah. you know. And it, It's weird because two and a half years ago before this happened I said I'd never brew a hazy beer <laughs> you know and now here yeah. I am like that's kind of what we're known for uh, and then we have our, our new the blonde like you just mentioned the, mm-hmm. the, the non-fruited version of it called Res Dog okay. is taking off now to where that's now our number two beer um, and then we just you know we're kind of all over the spectrum we like to brew obviously my dad's stout we brew that. It's called the 49. We do an Imperial style. We have several IPAs, mm-hmm. you know, um, and then uh, an Amber, an Amber Ale, which you don't see a lot of anymore. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we just we like to do something different all the time. We have a lot of rotating stuff, seasonal mm-hmm. stuff. We just like to keep it fresh and do different things. So, yeah. Has it been hard sometimes to like puts take take stuff to market that like you personally absolutely love but it just doesn't do well because yeah just your personal taste is different yeah. that you know, must well, be a hard thing well i'll tell you what's weird it's kind of actually the opposite so when you're a new brewery especially in oklahoma because we're still young as yeah. far as a, a, uh the, the culture sure. craft beer culture in oklahoma is still young and so we're kind of on the end of this we're probably one of the last breweries to, that will experience this mm-hmm. but man when you're new like it all sells yeah, you know, it's just like it, it'll it'll all sell. Some of it doesn't sell quite as good as you want, you know. But what the things that I've had to get used to are the styles that I typically wouldn't drink on a regular basis, mm-hmm. um, like a Blondell, like Res Dog. Uh, now I will say, lately this summer, I've drank a lot of it. Right. Like I've actually come to really appreciate a Blondell and like it, but. You know, a year ago, if you'd have told me that I'd be drinking a Blondell a lot, I'd tell you, you're crazy. And so when you have these beer styles that sell well, that's not your passion, <laughs> you know, or it's not your favorite style, yeah. that's kind of the hard part to swallow because you got this other beer that you're real passionate about right. and you want people to like it. You it, know? Goes for, it goes to a job from a hobby real quick. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's just like all these beers are kind of like, they're kind of like your kids. You want them all to do well. But when yeah. you have as many beers out like we've done, which for a young brew, we've put out a lot of different beers. Okay. And so sometimes it seems like it's maybe been too many that and it maybe keeps any particular beers from really taking off sure but um it's you know what we're trying to do is figure out what sticks yeah you know throw it all against the wall and see what sticks you know there's all mm-hmm. these different kinds of beers that we like to brew and you know what's what's going to work for us and i think we finally gotten we found our groove the biggest mistake i made was not going in the beginning not going all in mm-hmm. on exactly what I'm passionate about, which sure. is these IPAs. You know, I wanted in the beginning, for whatever reason, we tried to be uh, something for everybody. Right. We, we wanted, we, we tried to be the brewery that had a beer for everybody. And 
what I really should have done is what we're doing now, which was, you know what? We brew great IPAs Mm. and I'm going to brew as many of them as I can and different variations of them and try different hops and try different ways of making them. And we're going to put it all out there and we want to become known as the brewery that makes the best IPAs in Oklahoma. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, For everyone listening, you can go to Skydance Brewing on Instagram and see everything there. And then you guys have a website as well. Yep, skydancebrewing.com, yeah. uh, Skydance Brewing on Facebook, Twitter. I mean, we're on Twitter. I've not. I'm I've on never, Twitter as well. I've never, I've never figured Twitter out. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, it's great for like, uh, for me, it's like good for news. Well, and during the game, I'm sure you like oh, tweeting yeah. out during oh, the yeah, game. Dude, day. Somebody will say, dude, you know how I found out Bob Stoops retired at OU was Twitter. Yeah. Like it used to be the news. Yeah. You it's know, now Twitter it's Twitter. Now, isn't it? Somebody yeah. says something. Hey, did you hear this happen? I say, oh, let me look on Twitter first. Yeah, straight away. If it's not on Twitter, it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, it's, uh, it's awesome, man. I, I, the story is, uh, it's a really good story um, and I think that a lot of people you know need to hear it so everyone listening please share this story because yeah. it uh, you know it's not just like oh I started brewing because you know I thought it'd be a good idea and yeah. it's kind of growing in Oklahoma now no like there's there's a real meaning behind this and, and there's a real passion and you know like this this is not just a business for yeah. you. Like this is like dad's legacy and everything that you've learned growing up. Yep. You know, and it's And your purpose. Yeah. And if you're gonna start a business, you've gotta be real in tune with your purpose. Yeah. You know, and I just I think like I, there was a lot of things that kept me from starting a brewery, mm-hmm. mental blocks and, and just, th- you know, I didn't think it was for me. Like I said, I grew up sure. poor in this trailer in Little Axe, Oklahoma, and I thought I just wasn't made out for s- being a CEO, you know, a right. business owner. And I think that if people see and this and the reason I talk about, you know, I like to tell the story and I like to talk about these types of things is because I want people to see that if I can do it, they can do it. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are going to go to the grave with their dreams. Mm -hmm. And to me, there's nothing worse in this world than to die with your dreams still inside you and having not shared it with the world. And, you know, to be honest with you, like in our Native American culture, that's like so prevalent. Mm. It's horrible. Like they just you know, centuries of oppression has made a lot of our tribal members feel like they don't have a place in this country or in this world to do the types of things that they really want to do, that there's a system that's going to keep Mm -hmm. them from doing it. And I thought the same way, you know, for a long time. But what I've learned is the only system that's stopping you is in your head, Yeah, you know? And so I like to tell these stories and talk about this stuff so that people see that, hey, if he did it, if he did it, we can do it, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's my purpose. My goal is to help as many people as possible see that, that they can be an entrepreneur and that entrepreneurship is like a way better life, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's uh, stressful and it's hard and it's difficult and I've sleep a lot less, but it's, you know, creating something of your own and the legacy that you're going to leave behind mm-hmm. is uh, there's nothing like it. Well, and also like knowing that you've given it a go, yeah. right? Like yeah. if it doesn't work out and you, I have a friend who's tried, they've, he's tried every, uh, every time he comes out with an idea and he tries at it, he goes full at it. And finally now one of them's working mm-hmm. and they deserve everything because it's, he's tried, he's put his hours in. Yeah. Right. But if you don't try, you never know. Yeah. Uh, is that, we haven't really talked about this much, but, um, I know that you know, from, again, from us talking previously, like you, you're more involved now with the tribe. Yeah. So, so, so like I said earlier, you know, my, my mom left when I was, and she's, she's the one that was was Native American. So she left when I was young and, um, and then also see people don't know this, like people to this day think that all of these issues that we talk about with Native Americans were things that happened 200 years ago. Mm-mm. Like people all the time, well, why am I paying for something that happened 200 years ago? I didn't take your land. You know, yeah. We hear that kind of stuff all the time. What they don't realize is how recent it was that the federal government yeah. took th- their policy on Native Americans was to eliminate Native Americans. And here's how recent that was. My mom, the, so I didn't meet my grandpa on my Native American side until I was like 10, 12 years old. And the reason for that was my mom was taken by the state 
when she was like three years old mm. and given up for adoption, the state, you know, sent her off with a white family who that's, you know, I grew up as that being my grandparents and stuff. And I love them to death, you know, great people. But um, it caused the next generation and her really yeah. to not grow up in that Native American culture. And so I wasn't even exposed to it that much. Uh, I mean, I, I knew I was Native American. I was enrolled Native American. And I grew up in a Native American community in yeah. Little Axe. All my friends are absentee Shawnee and Kickapoo. And so I was in, I was involved, but I wasn't really involved with my particular family mm -hmm. and my tribe until later. And um, so, again... All of one of these careers I had, I, when my dad was sick, I had friends that were cops and they were always trying to talk me into you know, becoming a police officer. And so for a little bit there, I, uh, so I went to the police academy and I became a tribal police officer. Okay. And um, what, my chairman at the time of our tribe, Christy, she came to my graduation and it was all like tribal police. And she got to carry our tribe's flag, which you see behind me. She got yeah. to carry the flag in our graduation. And um, we, I don't know, a month later, she calls me and she says, hey, our casino needs a security director. Are you interested? And I'm like, well, I don't know. What's it pay? You know, and I'm. Yeah. And so she gave, she gave me a number and I was like, I'll be up there tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know? When can I stop? Yeah. When do I yeah. start? So yeah. I, that was my introduction to the casino business. And then within a year, year and a half or whatever, I was an assistant GM sure. and I was building a new casino. And, you know, that's that's where, like I said earlier, all the things that all the different careers I've had have led me to something. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, I knew I wanted to start this brewery. But I wasn't sure about the business side. You know, sure. could I build a brewery? Like, well, I, in my head, I'm like, man, these breweries are like these big buildings and all these yeah. big tanks, and it's like real complicated. And uh, the tribe said, we want to build this casino. We want it open in uh, 90 days <laughs> because our tribal elections were in 90 days. And there, all we had was this field of grass. Yeah, you go build something land. over there. Yeah. Yeah. And it was out there by Chandler, Oklahoma, between Chandler and Wellston. And, um, my boss, who was the general manager, uh, he put me in charge of that casino and the project, and and we had it open in 85 days. Yeah, but and now you know how to build a building. Yeah, well, that that day, I can remember the grand opening, the opening day. Yeah. That night, driving home, is when I really knew I was going to open a brewery. Because if I could do that, I built yeah. a team of like 112 employees, um, and and just and built this place from the ground up with the help of that team. Yeah. I learned from that project right there that it was not. I didn't have to know how to open a brewery. Yeah. I knew I needed to know how to build a team, and team building, being able to build a team, and being able to care about those team members and and want what's best for them. Right. And then, you know, Zig Ziglar always says, you can have everything in life you want if you help enough other people get what they want. Yeah. And I learned that for sure, that that was absolutely true because in the end, I'm getting all this credit, but it was them that did it. Yeah. You know, it was that team that built the place and the, you know, one, one of them built the cage and, and got the, uh, you know, accounting side going and the, and the slot machines and the F and B side, yeah. all this stuff. So, um, yeah, I drove away that night, drove home and said, yeah, I can do it's this. Happening. I'm going I'm to do this brewery. And that's things really took off from there. Yeah. So. But more recently, like you are starting to get really involved now. Yeah. Like, so thinking about it. Yeah. Well, um, so I, I, several years ago I did, I, I ran for office and, uh, I ran for treasurer and I lost by like a handful of votes, just yeah. a few votes. And, at the time, I probably was I wasn't ready to run for office, <clears throat> and I didn't. At the time, I also wasn't real, didn't quite realize the politics and yeah. tribes. You know, like it can be brutal, and just me running and losing caused me a lot of issues in my career um, with because of the political side of okay. it. But um, since I've left the tribe. Um, I think like I've really, you know, the top 50 Native American Entrepreneur Award. Um, I mean, our beer is like yeah. all over the state. Um, the tribes and casinos are like 
really pumped up about our brand and our business and they're real supportive and our tribal members are seeing the podcast, you know, yeah. where it's just like, I think I've made it real clear that my purpose is to help other people, Sure, you know, yeah. and the, that that's the style of leadership that this, not only that the tribe needs right now, but what this country needs right yeah. now is uh, servant leadership. That's what's badly needed everywhere mm-hmm. right now. And, um, I just think like we've had some changes in the tribe recently with the last election. Um, and so I, I'll say it is like, this will be the first time anybody's heard this, Yeah, but I'm going to run for chairman next year Okay, of the tribe. And I'm going to try to do that and run this brewery at the same time. Yeah. Build and, a team. Yeah. And, and the thing about it is like, it's maybe is the timing's not ideal, but it's the best timing as far as my chances of being able to win that election. Mm-hmm. And it's, I've, you know, with my grandpa being chairman for a long time, just always felt like it was a calling. Yeah. I felt like that's the way for me to help the most people and to have the biggest impact. And I, to be honest with you, most likely I'll, I'll the terms are two years. Mm-hmm. Most likely I'll tell people right off the bat, I'm going to be in there for two years and then we're going to pass it on to somebody else Yeah, because I just want to make an impact and, and then the other thing is like, yeah, sh- should I be doing that at the same time I'm trying to open my new brewery and tap room? Probably not. But how many times in your life do you have an opportunity to be the leader of a sovereign nation? Right. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah, you're right. You know, so, yeah, um, yeah we're going to give it a shot. That's awesome. So. Well, and also like, you know, back to the whole memento more, like. That's you it. Wanna wait? Why, yeah. why wait? Yeah, it could why? be. I could do. I could wait until. You know, I'm no longer needed every single day yeah. in the brewery, but that day may not come. Exactly. It might not do. When we moved to Montana, my dad was the age I am now. Yeah. And that seemed like yesterday. Like yeah. it went by like that. Now, another one of those, yeah. and I'm an old man. Right. You know, if I'm alive. Yeah. If I'm alive. You know, so what if I decide instead of doing it next year, what if I wait another two years? Well, mm-hmm. mate, well who says I'm going to be here? Then? Yeah. Who yeah. says I'll still be alive? Yeah, it's uh, I mean, uh, that's one thing that I like. I I, I try to because I think it's something we all we all take it for granted. Right. We just don't think about it. But as long as you can consistently remind yourself that, like, we're not here forever. Time running out. Mm-hmm. Go do something that you want to do. You know, figure it out. Like, and I, you know, and going the other way on this too. Like, I have a friend who like continually will push himself to. He likes fast cars, and yeah. expensive cars. Yeah, and he sees that as like you know the whole kind of. I think it's. I've heard Tony Robbins say this. I don't know if it's his quote specifically, but you know, if you're going to take the island, burn the boats. Mm-hmm. And you have to, like, if you want to go do something, like, you mm-hmm. have to go all in, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. A friend of mine, Kevin Rivera, who we had on the, on the pod, on my podcast has a saying of all in, you mm-hmm. know, and he lives his life all in yeah. all the time. And if you think about it, like, why wouldn't you? Like, w- what other way yeah. is there to live? You know, to me, man, life is all about experiences you know, it's just yeah. full of experiences and there's too many of us who don't experience anything Yeah, because we're stuck in this little bottle where it's like, we're just existing and we just day to day. Yesterday is the same as today and tomorrow mm-hmm. is the same as yeah. the next day. And, and they're not experiencing things, you know? And I, I think that's sad, but I, th- I think it's like you have the only way for you to get those experiences is to push yourself and put yourself in uncomfortable situations, you know, mm-hmm. and it's just, yeah, like running for chairman, you know, it's like, yeah. yeah, everything about it's not ideal right now, but I mean, I can do it. Yeah. You know, I know, I know I can do it and there may not ever be another chance or a better opportunity mm-hmm. to make it happen, you yeah. know, but at the same time, I want to make sure that I, you know, don't lose focus on this other purpose that sure. I have here, which again is about creating experiences. You know, I want to, I want somebody to have that experience I had with my dad. Yeah. You know, I want somebody to be able to say, man, I remember the last time I had a beer with my dad and I want him to say it was a fancy dance yeah. or a res dog or whatever, you know, yeah. or just the experience of some kid 
that grew up hearing about this Native American that started a brewery and maybe he comes to work in my brewery one day yeah. and maybe he goes and starts his own brewery or he yeah. takes over my brewery. Who knows? You yeah. know, I mean, those are, those are impacts that own, th- those are certain impacts that you get to have as an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. certain impacts you get to have as a political leader, you know, and maybe I can make impacts both. in both areas. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Well, man, this has been amazing. Like there's a lot of things that I've just learned today that, you know, just from doing a little bit of research and, but I never expected the, uh, the Montana story about your dad. Yeah. That, that's, <laughs> that's special for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, and I hope, you know, you get to go up there in, in September and have a great time and yeah. take your son up there and that be, uh, not not be too crazy. Yeah. Next time, <laughs> no next time, maybe I'll be telling you a story about a bear. Attack. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but no, this has been awesome. For everyone listening, go to uh, Skydance Brewing uh, on all social media platforms, and I'll, I'll post all the links down below. But also go to Jake's podcast, Brewed with Hustle. Yep. Brewed with Hustle on Apple, Spotify, yeah. YouTube. We're real proud of the YouTube version. Oh, you have to. I mean, you, it's the way forward. It could, yeah. it could be the new uh, the new Netflix, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but no, th- thanks so much for your time. And yeah. everyone, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next episode. Cheers. Cheers. This podcast was presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, who've been telling Oklahoma's story through its people since 1927. Follow them online at OklahomaHOF.com and definitely on Instagram at OklahomaHOF. Catch you next episode. Cheers. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.